I'm Hunter Bosnick. It's really nice to see everyone here. Um, my, my presentation is on cloning with Dr. Jason Fischel, and this is for my ethics uh, presentation that I did last semester. So, first thing is the philosophy that is found in cloning is a utilitarianism, which simplified is the best benefit for the largest group of people. It's one of the prime philosophies that we see in our government and in our ethics in general is whatever we can do that will benefit the most people, which you see a lot in medical philosophies as well. The basic terms that go with this is biotechnology, which is manipulation of bio biological systems and organisms through technological means. And bioengineering is when you actually engineer and create technologies for your, for your biological systems and organisms. Therapy is whenever you do this in order to help someone get back to a place where they previously were, in the case of injury. And enhancement is whenever you use these to propel someone past where they were previously. And um, a lot of the controversy that we have seen this has been evident through the Olympic Blade Runner, who we heard about in the last Olympic Games. And there was a lot of controversy about him because he was using biolog biological technology. And a lot of people were questioning whether or not this enhanced him above and beyond his, his competitors because he had to have the amputations. And whenever people saw him as fast as he was, they questioned if that gave him an edge, which is where a lot of the controversy of biotechnology comes in with sports. Because people question if this will give you an edge over your competitors as we face with him. But the medical applications of biotechnology is we can create artificial organs, we can create uh, prosthetics to help people. This way, people who require, who require replacement hearts, replacement lungs, and forth, we can create artificial organs, artificial lungs, artificial hearts to replace those instead of having them wait on the organ donation list. That way we can speed up the process of their rehabilitation and we can eliminate the need for donation entirely. And the research and theories that go into the prosthetics and limb replacement have greatly jumped forward to where we are today. We have done a lot of advancements in that to are able to actually fully replace a person's appendage, a person's arm, a person's leg, with fully functioning digits. Previously, you had a mannequin arm where it was just a block and you couldn't do anything with it. Now through technology and cybernetics, we're able to create fully functioning arms, fully functioning digits where you can even manipulate your fingers. Now what does this really have to do with anything? Well this is one of the theories that has been proposed uh, uh, along with cloning. As previously stated, we can create the organs, we can create the prosthetics, but people have also put forth instead of using technology and the funding required for that, we can also use cloning. Now what is cloning? Cloning is the asexual production of a genetically identical copy of a single living being. What does that mean? It means we can, through a lab, create a fully functioning double of a person, or we can create doubles of their parts. We can create a double of someone's lungs, someone's heart. This is almost identical to what we're looking to do with bioengineering and biotechnology because we don't have to create an artificial instrument, we can just create a part of the person. And there's multiple ways that we can do this. The first of which is DNA cloning, which is where you take a DNA strand of a human being and replicate that on a massive scale. You can use that to create full tissue of the person through just a single strand of the DNA, which is unheard of before, but recently we've been able to perform this. Reprodu reproductive cloning is a little less science fiction. It's where you just take uh, the person's DNA and inject it straightly into an embryo, into an implanted fetus, which allows you to grow a double of the person from already uh, through natural reproduction almost. It's not asexual where you don't have both parts of sexual reproduction. It is still sexual reproduction, but you're you're designing the embryo, the person, into what they're going to be. 
And therapeutic cloning is the third cloning. There's not a whole lot of discussion or research into this because it's more of a philosophy. It is cloning for the use of medical applications and for cloning for medical purposes, which is previously stated for your organs, for your tissues. Now the benefits of going through therapeutic cloning is life-saving, really. It's for terminally ill patients, for those who lack fully functioning organs. This is to replace previous practices of donors and to, rele and to just, um, eradicate the need for the system because there's a lot of negatives that go with the system. But the benefits of going with cloning is that you can create portions of a human being for amputees instead of having to use the time to create either a fully functioning prosthetic or a non-functioning prosthetic, that person is still without their appendage, that person is still without a part of themselves. And they have to go through their entire life seeing this and thinking, I am incomplete. Through the use of cloning and being able to replicate their entire tissue and being able to replace that tissue, you can eliminate this. As well as there are a lot of issues that go with the, re the replacing of organs. The issue is that organ donation is a, t is a costly process, not just in, co in funding, but in lives. There is a problem with donation in that even if you are on the list to receive an organ donation and you manage to find a perfect fit, it is still not a perfect fit. Uh, what happens a lot of the time is a person goes through the entire process, survives long enough to receive a replacement organ, say it's a heart, say it's a lung. Perfect match in every way. You replace the organ, you go through the surgery, your body can still reject the organ because it is not yours. You need specific coding, specific DNA, and if it does not match that, your body will fight that off. To your body, that is an infection, that is a virus, something that it has to fight off. The patient has to take medication for the rest of their life in order to lower their immune system, in order so that their immune system does not fight off this new tissue. That will kill them alone, the rejection of the organ, but also the lowered immune system. If your immune system is not strong enough to, com to combat very even minor illnesses, you will die from a cold. The flu will knock you out in a couple of weeks. You will not stand a chance for the rest of your life, and you have to be on this medication for the rest of your life by simply replacing them with even a mechanical heart, you can eliminate this because it is still a foreign object, but it's not foreign tissue that the body is having to fight. It takes, that's even if you can survive long enough to get to that point. It takes thousands and thousands of people working together to even get you on the list, to even get you to the point to where you can receive a donation. From 1988 to 2000, over 40,000 Americans died while waiting for organ transplant. Now, I say Americans died because this is just our country. This is a process that goes across worldwide because there's people everywhere and everyone needs to be healthy. And just in America, it was 40,000 people. Across the globe, it is so many more people are passing because they're waiting to get their organs. They're waiting to get what they need. An average of 22 people die each day waiting for transplants. That's 22 people every day have lost their life waiting for a transplant. And through the use of cloning, if we're able to work in a lab to create even just the simple organ, you can eliminate that entire need for the donations and you can eliminate the entire need for being on medication. The reason why the body fights it is because it is a foreign organ. It is a foreign implant to your body. It is a virus. If you're able to use the patient's own DNA, their own genetic coding, you can create a secondary part of their own body that they lost and replace it. No medication needed aside from the acclimation to uh, your own body because it is still having to be implanted. But you have a much better chance of survival if it's your own DNA and there's no more waiting to be on the list because there is no list. It would be costly, but 
it's your own body. That way you can survive. The issue a lot of times with this, however, is a lot of the research for cloning goes through stem cell research and gene research, which is a very controversial research in general because of where we do receive the research. Because you need the stem cells from individuals, you need their cells, you need genes. And a lot of people are very, not necessarily afraid of the research, but they are uncomfortable with this research. This is an issue that we're going to have to agree on some compromise in order to get to this. However, instead of going through stem cell research and gene research, there is a possibility that we can go through reproductive cloning, which we have agreed upon in recent scientific discoveries. If we are able to use a living person and allow them to grow a second person, a second copy of this individual, we're able to bypass a lot of questionable research that people are having a lot of issues, a lot of controversial research. This is going, this would allow us to do the research, do the experiments that we would need in order to facilitate a lot of cloning. But there's also another benefit to this. You could do reproductive cloning, not just on humans. There's been a lot of recent films about Re about reproducing extinct animals. We could do this in theory, but it would require a lot of research that we would need to further. If we could, then a lot of issues we are having today of endangered species, of extinct species, if we could find a little bit of genetic material, a little bit of DNA, we could continue on a species, we could prevent an endangered species from going extinct, and we could recreate some extinct species. This is not science fiction anymore. This is a future that we are able to create. This is something that we are able to do right now. It's just a very controversial topic, and a lot of people are unwilling to go through with it. As previously said, there's a lot of concerns with this, one of which is you're creating a complete copy of another person. There's a lot of people who question designer babies, cosmetic babies. This would be an issue because you're creating another person. A lot of people question and are scared of people designing their children. If you're cloning someone through reproductive cloning, you are designing a human being before they're even born. There's no way around that. You are, tr you are designing how someone will be. You have an entire map of what they will be because you have the person that you can use as an example. It's kind of like having a blueprint for your entire life. A lot of people don't like that because of the ethics and the, and the fears of designer children. And as said before with the Olympic Blade Runner, there would be an unfair advantage in a lot of people's eyes in the case of sports. When it goes from therapy to enhancement to where you are far superior to what you were before, people would use this to their advantage. We have a lot of issues with steroids in athletics and competitions. Cloning would be used as um, a scapegoat. Uh, not a scapegoat, my bad. Um, they would use this as a shortcut because if someone has a pair of lungs or um, if someone has a heart condition and they're playing sports. Okay, we're good. If someone wanted to gain an edge in a game, in a competition, and they knew that they, if they went to a lab and said, grow me a better pair of lungs, it is possible to do that. And if we further the science, we advance the science, we advance the research and allowed it to be open to the public, there would be individuals who would do that. As well as celebrities wanting to make themselves look better. If they have scarring, if they have injuries, you, they could replicate their body and just take from the body and to prove themselves. And there's also, an issue that nobody really talks about in reproductive cloning. Stigma, challenges, discrimination. Because people know you are a designer child, they would look at you different. They would see you differently because they see you, in a lot of ways, people would see you as a natural. Whether or not you are or are not, it's not your, you have no impact on that. You have no decision making on that. It's what other people will see you as. A way to address this 
would take generations of working with the people, having them be more open to it. It is workable, but it will be an issue for a lot of people. This is something that we can do now. This isn't science fiction like it has been in the past. This isn't a movie that someone can make. The reason why we need to talk about this now is because we have the technology, we have the ability. Most people just aren't open to it yet. And we're at a crossroads right now where we can do this at any point, at any time. If we can come to an agreement to further this research, to do these experiments, we will have cloning. We are at a very interesting time where we can talk about something before it happens. This needs to be discussed because we can decide the ethics, we can decide the philosophies here and now as it is happening. We do not have a chance to do that for most anything that will change the world. Here's our opportunity. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Olivia Cannon, and tonight I'll be talking to you about marine fungi. I'm going to tell you in just a minute. So first I'm going to give a brief overview of what fungus is. Uh, the kingdom fungi is obviously a kingdom unto itself, so it's next to, you know, plants, animals, protists. It's under the domain eukarya. And fungi are heterotrophs, which means they can't make their own food, so they have to get it from outside sources. And the property that's unique to fungi is that they externally digest their food and then absorb the nutrients. And interestingly enough, they're actually more closely related to animals than they are to plants. So marine fungi is essentially what it sounds like. It's fungus that lives in or around salt water for the majority or even just part of its life. Uh, out of the estimated 1,500 species, um, that's including the species we already know, uh, species that are still being researched and looked at, and species that we don't know anything about yet. And marine fungi are not a taxonomic group, which means that they're not a separate phylum all by themselves. They're actually made up of many different phyla of fungi. So the habitats that they live in are very diverse and as you can see from the list here, you know, it's, it's a pretty broad area that they can live in. If there's salt water, they'll be there. And some of the factors affecting where and how they live include salinity, current, availability of substrates to grow on, and how long and how deep they're submerged in salt water. So here's some pictures of some visible uh, fungi structures. There's Trichocladium acrospora on the driftwood, which looks kind of like cobwebs. And then there is an unidentified species of fungus that looks kind of like little balloons that was retrieved after a trawl. So diet, as previously mentioned, fungus uh, digest their food externally. Many marine fungi are saproprobes, which means that they get their nutrients by breaking down dead or decaying matter, which in the ocean is generally driftwood. Some others are parasitic, so they harm another organism to get their nutrients. And nitrogen is their preferred nutrient, which is often given off by decaying matter. So some fungi have a ben mutually beneficial relationship with photosynthesizers that are usually algae or cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria are bacteria that can perform photosynthesis. These associations are called lichens. And marine fungi can also grow uh, in or around plant roots, like mangrove roots or uh, sea grasses and salt marshes. And they exchange nutrients. And then also, like I said, some marine fungi are parasites, and they have known they are known to be parasitic on a whole range of organisms, plants, animals, and uh, chytrids are unicellular fungi that have flagella so they can move around and they're parasitic on algae and salt water 
and they are parasitic on frogs in freshwater. And then phytoplankton blooms include algal blooms, like red tides, which can be toxic or can deplete the oxygen in the water and kill off fish. So this is a case of parasitism not necessarily being a bad thing, except for the phytoplankton. And pictured here is a fish with red spot disease, which was caused by fungus and probably results in fish death, or at least makes the fish unsellable. So we have kind of a complicated relationship with marine fungi. They have a lot of potential in medical and ecological fields. And on the flip side, if you're in the fishing industry or if you're an aquarium owner, they're real pests. And we really are not that great for marine fungi because we cause pollution, which harms everything in the ocean, including these guys. And we really don't do anything good for them. In the medical field, there's a lot of potential because marine fungi have been known to produce all kinds of really cool compounds, like antibiotics, compounds that are effective against diabetes type 2, and even compounds that can be effective against leukemia cells. So there's a whole lot of untapped potential here, and there's a lot of testing being done. There are not a lot of marine fungi that cause disease in humans, and one of the main ones is lobomycosis, which causes lesions in both humans and dolphins. And weirdly enough, you can actually get it from a dolphin, but you can't transfer it between people. Uh, marine fungi have a lot of potential for bioremediation because they produce enzymes that break down toxins and pollutants like oil, industrial toxins, and plastic. So there's a lot of potential for cleaning up the ocean. Economically speaking, marine fungi are pests. If a fungal outbreak happens in a uh, real heavily populated uh, hatchery, then it can spread very quickly and lead to large fish die-offs and large losses of money. Despite this, as of 2012, there were no antifungals being used in the fishing industry to combat this problem. And the picture there is of a fish with brachiomycosis or a fungal infection of the gills. In conclusion, <coughs> excuse me, there is still a whole lot we don't know about marine fungi. And it's a really understaffed and underrepresented field. In 1979, it was called boring because there were only about 500 species. Now we know better than that and we know how much potential they have and how much we have to learn from them. So luckily, the field of marine mycology or the study of marine fungi is on the rise and I for one am really excited to see where it'll go. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Lacey and I chose this topic for my honors project for Biology 1 with Bruce. Um, it's population dryas but it's also called younger dryas and basically younger dryas is the hypothesis to kind of explain what happened to mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and mastodons. Like, why are they extinct? Paleontologists have recovered fossils from ye like thousands of years ago, but they don't know what exactly happened that wiped out this whole population. Younger Dryas was the hypothesis that there was a sharp decline in temperature, creating glaciers or this huge ice age that wiped all the vegetation and mammals off the... It reached from Nova Scotia to Clovis, Mexico. Am I allowed to take this off? I can. It won't mess up. I like to use my hands. Okay, so... <laughs> okay, I'll point. The, as you can see, probably not that. 
The Holocene up there is where the vegetation was kind of on the rise. There was a global warming creating a kind of burst in the vegetation. And that's where this really cool Native Amer Native group called the Clovis culture kind of started popping up and their technologies were almost up to the European standard and actually surpassed it by their time frame that they were alive. And then the sharp decline, the younger dryas right there, um, is when the temperatures decreased almost six degrees Celsius to create the ice age. And then after that, you can see it's kind of like it got warmer and then colder and the big freeze when it from 16 to 22 was when it was thousands of years of just an ice age. The Dryas octopatala is a flower that was also a fossil that the paleontologists recovered and they know it came from this time because of where it was in the Earth's core as well as um, the pollen that was on the flower. As global warming increased, the water in the Atlantic began to, ri began to rise, and as the water rose, it became less dense. And when water becomes less dense, it doesn't seem to circu circulate as well. So all the water in the Atlantic stopped circulating, and so that stopped the heat flow. And that's kind of what caused, or that's the hypothesis of the Younger Dryas, that caused it to ice over, basically. This is a map of where the Ice Age was, the Hudson Bay. The effects of the Younger Dryas. It replaced forests in Scandinavia with a glacial, glacial tundra. It increased snow in mountainous regions, the loss of deposit in Northern Europe, drought, and even the extinction of most of the species in North America. In fact, 35 different mammals became extinct because of this. And this is a picture of the mammoths and the saber-toothed tigers, mastodons, were also, like those are my favorites because those are the ones you hear about in movies and stuff. The Clovis culture. Um, they were named after tools found in Clovis, in New Mexico, and they created, I've got pictures, right up there, that's kind of what they used to tie on at the end of arrows. In movies you'll see like cave paintings, those are also from this time period as well as um, later on, but when you see like mammoth on the walls, that was from before the Younger Dryas. They're considered the ancestors of most Indian tribes because they have Paleo, Indian, and Native American biology in them, like woven in. And they're the first human inhabitants to have created a widespread culture in North America. I thought choosing Younger Dryas as a topic was really cool because we're kind of in this point where we're going through a global warming as well. And last time this, to this magnitude it happened, everything froze over and all the mammals died. Now I'm not saying that's gonna happen to us because we're part of the reason why global warming is a thing right now. We have factories and pollution and we're heating up our own world and creating these glaciers to melt, whereas back then, well, there are a whole lot of hypotheses as why it became to warm. One of them was a meteor in the, the meteor had nano diamonds and nano diamonds are only in meteors, and so they started to heat up the Earth's core mixed with uranium and carbon, and that's kind of why the global warming thing happened. But 
the reason it became iced over was because of the circulation stop in the Atlantic, and that's not going to happen now because that wasn't the reason why, like, if that stopped and we didn't have heat circulation from the Atlantic, we still have heat circulation from things we're producing. So don't worry, we won't become extinct anytime soon. Fingers crossed. And that's all I have. So thanks for listening. Thank you everyone for coming here tonight. My name is DJ Cherry. I play softball around state. And um, this is one of my favorite projects that I ever did. Not that I don't love them all, but this is my favorite because we all have favorites. We just don't like to admit to it sometimes. And the biggest thing, it's all about the six dimensions of wellness. And people kind of hear that, they think it's something complicated because we hear dimensions and we think cubes, but I got this. We're gonna journey this together. The daily routine is a way to start your everyday life to live a happy, healthy life. I'm not saying this is key to all your success and happiness. I'm just saying this is a really good booster to start your day. <laughs> the six dimensions are physical, intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual, and occupational. Uh, physical refers to the wellness of the physical body. Intellectual addresses creative and mental activities and your openness to new ideas and schools of thought. Emotional gives you the ability to go through the rigors of life. Social is being a contributing member of your community, community college, no pun intended, and society. And spiritual is focusing on meaning and purposes of life. And occupational applies to the personal satisfaction you get from your career. Also very fitting because we're all here at college, right? Um, basically, throughout the whole packet, I have broken it down. And I only did it in a packet form so I could hand it out to people to kind of get a jump start in their day. It has a workout plan that could get you started. It's got some opportunities that you can do to get with a BMI, which is body measurement index, um, which I'm not a huge personal fan of. Everybody's different, but there's just some things that just kind of help you strive to the right way. When people hear the word diet, um, people all have their different in interpretations of it. But to break it down, uh, for the physical, find a routine or work that you like to do. For some people, it's just something, I say start with five things. Get up in the morning, start with five things I can get your day started, get your blood flow and get ready for the day. And for this workout, for our, um, our daily do, simple routine, you can do anywhere. There's push-ups, there's stretching, crunches, planks, mation twists, all the jazz. But you can always adapt it to what you like. For some people, maybe crunches isn't do it for you. Some people maybe hate planks because your elbows hurt. I don't blame you, I'm not a personal fan of them either. <laughs> Um, another, the next part is your nutritional choices. That gives you options. Um, back in the day, they'd have a pyramid, and it's changed through time. And now there's more of a choosemyplate.gov that helps shows the daily proportions you should have on fruit, grains, vegetables, protein, carbs, etc. Which we'll go back to in one second. To apply to your intellectual side, um, some things that might help is just read something. Not just like a text message that you get that's got so many abbreviations, I don't even know what it means anymore. But something that's maybe challenging, whether it's a novel, an article, something of interest, or do a daily puzzle to get the brain flowing again. We're fine. Crosswalks. Uh, coloring books are coming back. Didn't know if you hear about that one. It's really relaxing. I personally have one. <laughs> Another is emotional, which is the ability to go through the rigors of life. Uh, for some people, it's reading a therapy book. Personally, I've done that. I totally get why people do it. Um, I've changed and I've learned a lot through them. Either it's uh, one of them is written by two therapy doctors. It is called the Mind Gym. And at first you think, okay, athlete, Mind Gym. Yeah, you've read it. Okay, I'm, uh, yes, I'm an athlete and I've read it. But it's also got other things, uh, discipline, and it teaches you a lot. And it helps. It helped uh, just to learn other things outside the box. Another way to help your emotional that can just be a tidbit is um, let yourself cry at a movie. Don't hold it back. Just let it let it out. Maybe some chocolate. Just emotions are what make us human, and they're beautiful. Just embrace it. Um, one of the articles that was read about that I explained in this class was um, some people. The theory is that we're constantly going like this all day long. We're going to work, we're going to school, then we go to practice or whatever is in your daily life. And then all of a sudden you're finally getting ready for bed and you're like, wow, 
Did I even like sit down for 10 seconds and ask myself how I was doing today? Did I even acknowledge my day? <laughs> um, sometimes we don't give ourselves a moment to embrace like what it is we're feeling or we're thinking. And sometimes we just need to remember that. And that's also why some people believe uh, there's people who have issues dealing with emotions. So they feel so overwhelmed by all the emotions they're feeling. It's because they never give them the time of day, I guess is the best way to put it. The next one is social. Um, which I kind of did a little, you can challenge yourself, maybe uh, not everyone's a little different with social, some are just, everyone's their friend, some you've never heard a word out of them, which is okay, you do you, um, but maybe try next, like, good morning, have a good day, the head nod, the smile, the eye contact, you know, I know some, some people here have probably seen me, I'm always like, hey, I don't know if to wave or not, which just gets really awkward for me, but that's fine, just, you know what, what are the odds of you seeing that person again, besides going to school with them? <laughs> The next is spiritual, which focuses on meaning and purpose in life, which can differentiate for anyone. Um, a lot of recommendations to have a daily reading for whatever it is that you truly spiritually believe. Next is uh, occupational. Make sure your occupation is your passion. Um, some people, I get seeing dollar signs, but sometimes passion and happiness is the true key, and that's how you're really going to be set with your life. Um, to change up things, if you are at work, Instead of sitting in your office eating lunch alone, ask someone to go out with you. Or instead of eating lunch for your entire break, go outside and take a walk, a uh, fresh air. Um, unfortunately, at Rome State, we have a track, which is really, really cool for those who get to go there. Uh, for the nutrition standpoint, if that's what you want to prove on, the biggest way is that it's all about proportions. Uh, don't be the person who's like, oh, no, I can't eat this chocolate cake tonight. But live your life. It's okay. Maybe you eat it only eat that kind of stuff on Sunday. You do you. Uh, proportions are the way to go. <laughs> There's the two fruit, the two veggies, the protein, and the carb. The uh, most basic one that people follow are there's the six meals a day the size of your fist. A really good way to start your metabolism is start the top of your day with a glass of ice water and end your day with a glass of ice water. That's two cups out of the eight cups that you're already recommended to do, right? So now you just got six in between to fill out. For a lot of people, and me included, trust me, it takes a little bit. You got to go through progress. Um, it's all about just replacing your habits. And the, a lot of key people say it takes 21 days to replace a habit. And it's just a matter of what you want to replace it with. For some people, bag of potato chips, love the crunch, maybe try bag of almonds or a bag of celery. <laughs> Not that they really do a bag of celery, but if you catch my joke that I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to go with here. Are there, now there's veggie chips. I don't know if anyone's ever tried those in little veggie straws. They're really colorful. Nobody? It's fine. Um, but yeah, just, the, just the little things to add to your day. And that's what the daily routine is all about. It's just to start your day and to, to change it up and hopefully have a happy, awesome life. And thank you so much for being here. So for my project, I did it for my Biology 2 class. I researched un uh, medical breakthroughs that were discovered by accident, by mistake, or by chance. I researched, um, I researched many of them. I found several, and I picked out a few of the, what I thought were the coolest ones. Penicillin, smallpox vaccine, pacemakers, and a really cool, unexpected cancer cure, which I think could really be a real lifesaver. Now, after World War I, there were so many diseases that soldiers had brought back with them. So during the 20s and after, after, the world, after World War I, people were trying to find a way to combat all of these infectious diseases. And Dr. Alexander Fleming was one of the people trying to do that. Now, in 1928, he left his lab for a holiday for a few days. But what he had done is he had left a Petri dish full of Staphylococcus bacteria exposed to the air and what I think is really cool is he left his lab window open, which is something you really should never do in a lab, ever. And what he had uh, noticed upon his return to a lab is this petri dish full of Staphylococcus bacteria had this white splotchy mold in it. He also realized that the staph did not grow around the mold. It, se it seemed as if this mold was inhibiting the growth of the bacteria, and that is exactly what was happening. He researched it and noticed that it had antibacterial properties, and he, he, he harnessed these properties and used them to make the first antibacterial agent, agent which he named penicillin. It was called the miracle drug because it, because it could be used to help combat several diseases, including uh, pneumonia, 
um, meningitis, and it's used um, in dentistries all over to help combat with um, bacteria. Its first big use was for soldiers during World War II. It was discovered in 1928, but it wasn't used until about World War II because it had to be developed. They had to figure out exactly how to use it. But it's now used quite often. There are many forms of it, which is why it's still effective even though it's several decades old because um, antibiotics uh, slowly become less and less useful as, as bacteria becomes more resistant, but penicillin is still very useful. The smallpox. It's, this smallpox was a terrible disease, especially in the 1700s. It's extremely infectious and has killed more people than all other contagious diseases combined. Um, symptoms include blisters, rashes, vomiting, nausea. It uh, kills almost everyone. Very few people actually survived it. It was especially bad for children because their immune systems weren't as strong as, uh, as in adults. It's caused by this, this virus. It's called the variola virus. So obviously in the 1700s, people were trying to find a way to combat this virus. Unfortunately, viruses are hard to kill. You can't use antibiotics on them. Those only work on bacteria, and viruses are already tricky to kill because they're technically not alive. So you, all you can really do is try to destroy them. And we found a way to do that. Dr. Edward Jenner overheard some milkmaids talking about how people who had cowpox did not seem to get um, smallpox. He looked into it and found that was correct. Cowpox victims were immune to smallpox. He researched cowpox and found the bacteria vaccinia. In using vaccinia, he developed a vaccine for smallpox. These vaccines were extremely effective. They were produced in massive quantities and everyone got a dose of it. And vaccinations are no longer required as of 1972 because the disease has been eradicated from the United States, but we still have a large surplus of the vaccine just in case it shows back up. In the 1950s, people were trying to find a device to record heartbeats for research. And this man, this inventor, Wilson Greatbatch, was trying to do just that, to invent a device to record heartbeats. And as he did this, he installed the wrong part. And he realized this, that this part emitted an electrical pulse instead of recording heartbeats. What he had actually invented by accident was the pacemaker. What is a pacemaker? It's an electronic device that regulates heartbeats. It shocks the heart with a mild electronical, electrical pulse. It's used for people who have an irregular heartbeat for, from medical problems, diseases, sometimes when you get older. The earliest versions were external and very bulky, but now they're internal and very small, very compact, and they've saved thousands upon thousands of lives. And this one's my personal favorite, so I saved it for last. Could malaria cure cancer? One of the most deadly medical conditions. Malaria is caused by the protist plasmodium. It's a protist native to Africa. It lives in mosquitoes. And you get it from being bitten by an infected mosquito. The parasite inhabits red blood cells. And it does this to invade the body's immune system. If it's inside the red blood cells, the white blood cells can't see them. And they can, they're free to multiply as much as they want. And they multiply, and they multiply, and they multiply, and then they rupture the red blood cells. Just like that. These, red, these dead red blood cells then can accumulate inside the blood vessels and block them. So now, not only do you have a, an, an invasive protist trying to kill you, you now have blocked blood vessels. It's just a whole new set of problems that you really don't want to deal with. And it's almost always fatal. Hundreds of thousands of people die from this every year. It's particularly dangerous for pregnant women because it can easily kill the child by attacking its placenta. So because of this, researchers are trying to find a vaccine to help pregnant women. And what they have found has, is extremely surprising. They discovered that the plasmodium uses a special protein to attach to a sugar molecule on the surface of, of the placenta cells. This protein is called VAR2CSA. It adheres to that sugar molecule right there. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. The sugar molecule is on the surface of the placenta, 
and on the surface of cancer cells, but not healthy cells. So, research have modif researchers have modified this protein by combining it with a toxin, and with this new protein toxin combination, they have they are trying they are using it to kill cancerous cells. What happens is the protein part sticks to the cancerous cells. The toxin will kill the cancerous cells, and it will leave the healthy cells alone. Now, this isn't, a, this isn't used for treatment anymore. It's still fairly new. More research is required, but it definitely could potentially save many lives. That's it. All right, so what I chose to do uh, is do a project that walks you through a complete eye exam, lets you know exactly what the doctor is looking at, exactly what he can find. A lot of people don't realize how in-depth eye exams can be, and a lot of people don't realize how important it is to get an exam every two years. They just think, eh, my vision's fine. But there's a lot more to it other than just checking how well you can see. There's two parts to a full exam. The first part is called the refraction. That's where the doctor actually finds uh, what prescription you need to be able to see clearly. And the second part is called the comprehensive exam itself, and that is where the optometrist will check the health of the patient's eye. The refraction is finding the visual acuity of each eye and making sure that your eyes work well together. Uh, also correcting any refractive errors, which is uh, the process of going through finding your prescription. And a foropter, which is the device you see over here, it's basically a series of trial lenses. And that's where they do the, is one better or is two? Like, you know, five times, you know, over and over 30 minutes. He's fine tuning it and what he's doing is he's He's trying to get those muscles in your eyes to relax where they need to be instead of overworking, trying to correct the vision on itself. So why do we need refractive correction? Well, the average power of a human eye, of the normal human eye, is about 58 diopters. A diopter is just the unit of measurement we use to um, describe the power of an eye or the power of a lens. So a normal eye has about 58 diopters of strength. A refractive error means that an eye does not have that strength. So there's two kinds, hyperopia or farsightedness, and that is where the eye is 2 minus, meaning it's less than 58 diopters, which means it needs plus power to correct, to fill in that gap. Myopia is the opposite, nearsightedness, and that's where the eye is 2 plus, it's over 58 diopters. So we add a minus lens to bring that power down to where it, it needs to be to see. It's a, it's a game of filling in the gap. Now here you see the picture of the blue over there. I'm gonna to try to speak loud enough uh, to come over here and show you, it's just a bit easier. So up here we have, you see that red dot? That's on the retina. That's the part of your eye that actually has the cells that allows you to see. So a normal eye, the light goes in and focuses on the retina there. On a myopic eye, theoretically, the light would focus and it would be behind the retina. Right here on the retina, that light is hitting in a, you know, a broad band, which is what makes it blurry. On a hyperopic eye, the light is focusing before the retina. So everything hitting here, again, is what gives you blurry vision. So our goal is to adjust, not our goal, excuse me, <laughs> the optometrist's goal is to um, get a lens in front of this eye that will pull it back or pull it forward to where it'll be on the retina where it needs to be so you can see. Hope everybody heard that. Um, just a really neat illustration there. A lot of people wonder what the importance is. You know, why, why does that happen? What's going on? Well, this chart right here that you see, it's called the Snellen chart. Everybody knows what that is. You know, you stand away and you read down to the smallest you can see. That was actually invented uh, in the, during the Civil War by a man who just wondered why sharpshooters could see so well. What, what made them special? How well was their vision? So he created this chart that actually uh, the different size letters are specific to how far away the patient is from that chart. So if somebody, you know, has what we call, you know, 2020 vision, oh, I have 2020 vision, you know, I don't need help. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people say that. Well, that means that at 20 feet away, you can see, you know, a normal eye could see that far away. If somebody has 2200 vision, they can only see at 20 feet what a person with normal vision can see 200 feet away. So that's kind of a gauge there when you go to the doctor and you know, he tells you, oh, you have 20-60 vision, we need to get you some glasses. 
you know, kind of giving the idea there. And just because somebody has 20-20 vision doesn't mean they don't need to get eye exams. That is just a kind of a, a ballpark figure for how well your eyes work together. It has nothing to do with the health of your eyes, okay? Now, going into the comprehensive exam, this is where it checks the full health of the eye. Usually there's a, a pre-testing that you go through. They check visual field. A lot of times this is done with a machine now, but it basically just tells you, you know, from central to peripheral how much you can see, how well you can see, and they can catch a lot of early problems by doing this. If somebody you know, doesn't have a lot of visual field back here in the periphery, it could be a sign of glaucoma, optic nerve damage, things like that. The tonometry or the dreaded air puff test, that, te that tests the pressure on inside of your eye. There's a gel inside of our eye. And a lot of times, eyes that are myopic, uh, where the eye is two minus, they're kind of oblong. That can increase the pressure, that can cause uh, retinal damage, damage to the optic nerve. So checking this intraocular pressure, the pressure inside your eye, gives the doctor a ballpark. You know, if it's really low, that can cause problems. If there's too much pressure, that can cause major problems too. So that, that air puff test that drives us all crazy is actually very important in the pre-testing system. Next is the eye muscle test. This is where the doctor has you look straight ahead and he's moving something up and down. You're like, why is he doing this? He's making sure that your eyes are moving the way they need to move. Now here you may think, oh, the eye that's turned, that's the one that's messed up. What it is, is the doctor has moved the pen this way and that eye is following. The eye that is not moving, that's the one that has a muscle imbalance. That's the one that needs the help. A lot of times when you see children um, with bifocals or you see children with an eye patch, they're, tr they're doing muscle training. They're, forced, they're covering the good eye and forcing that bad eye to do its job to build up that muscle. Pupillary reactions, so, you know, the doctor shines the light in your eyes and he's checking to make sure that your pupils go from big to small to big to small, moving like they're supposed to. That's so important because if the eye, if the iris does not react to that, it could be a sign of neurological damage. So that, that can be a big thing. Slant lamp examination. This is where you've got your, your head on this chin rest and he takes this bright light and he's scanning over your eyes. He's saying, look at my ear, you know, he's doing that. That's what this is. This is where the doctor, um, he may dilate your eyes. He may put a drop in there, make your pupils get all big and everything turns fuzzy. That's so he can look inside of your eye and make sure that the retina is, you know, is doing good. There's nothing on there that shouldn't be there. He's looking at the surface of your cornea, making sure it's clear, you know, and make sure there's no breaks in there so bacteria can get in. There's a lot of abnormalities found. I'm not going to uh, run all through this. I'll let you guys kind of kind of uh, gaze out of there. There's a lot of abnormalities that can be found during a slit lamp examination. A lot of times macular degeneration is found during this. A detached retina can be found. Cataracts. Let me go back. Picture A. Right here. That is actually a lens that is a cataract. It's solid white there. Again, found with a slit lamp exam. Diabetic retinopathy, blocked blood vessel other problems that can be found. These are pictures of abnormal retinas. I do have one picture of a normal retina. And as you can see, if you don't go get an eye exam, your vision may be just fine. But if you're on any kind of medication, if you're overweight, if you have diabetes, um, any kind of health problem there can have an effect on the retina. And every single one of these problems you're seeing up here, they will cause blindness if they're not caught early. A lot of times, these aren't even painful. That's why it's so important to go get an exam at least every two years, more than that if you're on certain medications. These are just some statistics um, on why you should get a yearly exam. Just kind of an overview here. Think preventatively. If you go get an exam and they catch something early, you're gonna save a lot of money versus going blind and having to try to figure out why, seeing if there's treatments, you know, slowly losing your vision, realizing something's wrong. So this is, eye exams are more of a preventative thing, okay? Um, a, lot of, a lot of people don't even know they have these issues. A lot of people, you know, just they go, oh, you know, I'm feeling a little funny, or I get these flashes of lights every now and then, no big deal, it's probably just my age, you know. We try to blame things on a lot of different things. And most of the time, eye doctors are the first people 
to catch serious conditions. Everything that goes on in our body affects our eyes. They are the only exposed organ. They are the only organ that can be replaced but not made to work again versus like a lung transplant or something like that. They can put artificial eyes in, but they can't make them work yet. There's just so many working parts that they, they haven't figured out how to do that. So it's really important to take care of your eyes. Any questions? All right, well, that is all I have. Thank you, guys. The statistics are mind-blowing. All across the world, one out of every one person will experience this in their lifetime. It's the leading cause of people dying across the globe. And it's death. In fact, according to this article that I read in Psychology Today, it listed the top, the top 10 fears that people have. Number two was death. Number one was public speaking. So according to that journal, I'd probably be better off in a casket right now. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I chose this topic because I believe that we're paying an enormous emotional price silenced by our society's taboo about talking about death and dying. And this leaves a lot of patients and family members to figure it out for themselves. And my goal is to illustrate the role of nursing in the process of death and dying and to provide an idea of how to discuss death with our loved ones. In 1969, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross illustrated in her book the five stages of grief, of grief of someone who's experiencing the death and dying phases. There's anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And I think it's important to note that individuals experience these stages entirely differently. Um, some may seesaw back and forth between the stages. Some may be stuck on a stage. And some may even skip some stages. However, Kubler-Ross does, or she states that a person will experience at least two of these stages during the death and dying process. The grief process is highly personal. These stages should not be rushed, and by understanding the stages of grief, the nurse can be more of an effective advocate for the patient. As death approaches, it's important for the nurse to recognize the symptoms of the terminal phase so that they can alter that care. For example, pushing fluids or nutritional supplements on a terminally ill patient may not be the priority. It may be more appropriate to provide a quiet atmosphere or decrease the environmental stimuli And it's also important to understand that death is very individualistic and what may be helpful to one patient may not be helpful for another. Understanding the patient's disease, learning the patient's coping abilities, and communicating effectively regarding their wishes are essential to proper treatment. I'm just going to go over some of the signs and symptoms that are experienced during the death and dying stage. A lot of family members have take a lot of issue with the decreasing level of consciousness of their loved one. Alertness is difficult to maintain as the body systems function less than optimal. The patient will become more sleepy, possible disoriented, um, leads to decreased level of consciousness. It's important as a nurse to speak to the dying person as if each of your word, as each of the words can be heard. And as a nurse, it's important that family members are encouraged to continue talking 
to the person that's passing away. These are some of the cardiac and pulmonary changes that occur during the death and dying process. The three leading causes of death in Americans are cardiovascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, and cancer. Irreversible failure of body systems leads to death. But the cause of death is always cardiopulmonary failure. Death occurs when the heart and lungs fail to oxygenate vital tissues and organs. Some of these symptoms, like tachycardia, which is increased heart rate, is some of the very first signs that you see. And then it's always followed by hypotension, which is low blood pressure. The cyanosis is the bluish discoloration that you might get around the lips or peripherally at fingertips or the feet. This is all due to reduced tissue perfusion. The patient will also undergo renal and GI changes. Anorexia is natural, and that's when the patient no longer wants to eat food. And as a nurse, it's really important to educate the family members and the loved ones that are nearby because their reasoning is that their loved one must be starving, but this is a natural process of death and dying. You're gonna see, of course, diminished intake, and then dysphagia is where they start to have difficulty swallowing. When this happens, it's important for the nurse to step in and discuss with the family that that's when giving that patient oral fluids needs to stop. And that's because you can cause that patient to aspirate. And once that fluid hits the lungs and that patient has a whole other set of problems that's gonna compromise the comfort of passing away naturally. Oligura and anuria is the absence of urine, urinating or the decrease of urination. And then the buildup of oral and tracheal secretions I'm sure all of you have heard about the death rattle, and a lot of family members have a fear of that because they believe that their loved one is strangling or struggling to breathe, but in fact that's very natural and that's not the case. And it's contradicted to actually suction those secretions out because it actually causes the patient more discomfort than helping. General debility, that is something that's very natural and normal to watch. You'll see that the patient eventually gets weaker and weaker. They'll have increased fatigue and overall a decrease in their functioning of daily living. Pain management is another thing that's very important in the death and dying process. We use the pain scale a lot to rate a patient's pain, but it's important to note that at some point in time when that patient isn't conscious anymore, you have to rely on other assessments to assess how much pain that patient is in. And those are furrowing of the brow, moaning, or um, restlessness. And then I have acute pain which is um, pain that usually is it, uh, characterized as lasting less than three to six months. Chronic pain is characterized as lasting more than three to six months or if it persists beyond a course of an acute disease. And then there's an acute onset of chronic pain, which is usually always due to a flare-up or an exacerbation of a chronic illness. And then there's different types of pain. Peripheral and neuropathic pain is caused usually by damage or to, or to disease affecting nerves which may appear, impair sensation, organ function, or other aspects of life. And idiopathic pain is pain that the cause is just unknown. 
not saying that, and I think it's important to demonstrate that when somebody has idiopathic pain, it doesn't mean that the pain's not real. We just don't know the cause of that pain. And, some, and these are a list of some of the pharmaceutical interventions that we also use, non-opiates, opiates, and adjuvant analgesics. Some of the non-opiates, -opi APAP is um, an abbreviation for Tylenol, um, NSAIDs are non-steroidals, and your corticosteroids. And your adjuvant analgesics, like your antileptics, antidepressants, or muscle relaxers are meant to be used with your opiates as a way to kind of synergize or to work together to provide optimal comfort for the patient. These listed right here are the commonly used opiate analgesics. We usually start off with the smallest dose and then as pain progresses, we gradually increase. And then of course, there's the non-pharmacological interventions. I think it's important to demonstrate all of these qualities as a loved one or a patient is going through the death and dying process. You can do that by being compassionate and just being there for them positioning, using skin care, mouth care, getting a toothpick to just moisten their mouth and making them comfortable, or just talking to them or holding their hand. I firmly believe that nobody should ever die alone. You know, the last days and hours can be the most significant and provide opportunities to create final memories to say your goodbyes and achieve a spiritual peace. And the one thing that I want you to leave with is that a death is just as important as a birth. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Caitlin Bellucci. And before we get started, I, have a, I would like you all to answer a couple questions for me. Raise your hand if you've ever had a soda. Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever had a piece of chewing gum. Raise your hand if you've ever had those donuts covered in powdered sugar. I've had way too many, I admit it. So you're probably wondering, what does soda, chewing gum, and those donuts covered in powdered sugar all have in common? Well, they all have food chemicals. In fact, they all use the most common, commonly used food chemicals today which are sodium benzoate, uh, glycerol triacetate, and titanium dioxide. To get started, we're going to talk about so sodium benzoate first. Here's the chemical formula for sodium benzoate. First, we're going to discuss the industrial uses for sodium benzoate. It's a corrosion inhibitors, paint additives, processing aids, and solvents. It's used in corrosion inhibitors to prevent machinery from wearing out over long periods of time while being exposed to much more harsh chemicals than sodium benzoate. It's used in paint additives to prevent the paint from getting sticky and nasty over time. Um, and it's used in processing aids and solvents so, because it has a slightly basic quality to it so it can, cl can clean things. For consumer uses, it's used in plastics, de-icing products, and personal care products. It's used in plastics to prevent the plastic from the plastic decaying over time. Um, it's used in de-icing products to make sure that your de-icing product stays good for all year round. So that two months of winter when it comes around, you kind of need to get that, ice, that one day of ice off your windshield, it still works. And it's used in personal care products as an antifungal to prevent bacteria from growing over a period of time so you don't get any like rash or infections. For, cons for consumption purposes, it's used in soft drinks, jams, jellies, salsas, maple syrup, margarine, and it uses these things as pre preservative to maintain flavor and ward off molding. And considering most of these things are stuff we just kind of put in our refrigerator door and forget about, I think we need it there. But it's not only used just as preservative, it's used also because it has a sweet aftertaste, and considering most people enjoy that, that taste, 
companies put it in there so people keep buying their products. Next, we're going to talk about glycerol triacetate. Oh wait, sorry, I forgot about the hazards of sodium benzoate. So when sodium benzoate is exposed to heat slash light and or mixed with vitamin C, it can cause a chemical reaction to make benzene. And benzene is a DNA damager that can harm you and future generations to come. Now we're gonna talk about glycerol triacetate. Here's the formula for glycerol triacetate. For industrial uses, it's used in adhesives, fillers, and solvents. An adhesive is, it creates a sticky quality, so the glue, the glue or the adhesive works properly. It's used as a filler to, to well, fill. It needs to fill that empty space. And it also is a solvent because it also has a basic quality like sodium benzoate. For consumer uses, it's used in personal care products, laundry detergents, and cigarette filters. It's used in personal care products because, again, it's also an antifungal like sodium benzoate. It's used in laundry detergents to maintain that, free, that clean, fresh smell when you wash your clothes. And it's used in cigarette filters to ward off bacteria over a period of time sitting in, on the shelf. For consumption purposes, it's used in chewing gum. And it's used in chewing gum so that the gum does not d disintegrate or tear up over time. So that's why when you chew that gum and it keeps going and it doesn't go away, that's because of the glycerol triacetate in it. There are some hazards to glycerol tri triacetate. It can cause skin and eye irritation in personal care products. I mean, personally, I don't put gum on my eyes, but hey, it's up to you. <laughs> So next we're going to talk about titanium dioxide. Here's the chemical formula for titanium dioxide. For industrial uses, it's used in adhesives, electrical products, wood coverings, and fuels. It's used in adhesives and wood coverings because it's a little durable, so it doesn't wear out over time. It's used in electrical products because it has titanium, so it's a little conductive. And it's used in fuels to maintain optimal efficiency so you get more bang for your buck. For consumer uses, it's used in crafting supplies, toys, and paper products. It's used in crafting supplies, toys, and paper products because of its unnatural white color. So when you go print off something for work, or in my case, school, it's the paper is white because of the titanium dioxide. That toy that your kids play with, well, I don't have kids, but the toys that your kids play with, they're white because of the titanium dioxide. And for consumption purposes, it's used for those little donuts covered in powdered sugar, and um, also the highly processed candies like M&Ms and Good and Plenty's. You know, when you bite into those and you see that white candy coating, that's because of the unnatural white color of titanium dioxide. Now, there are a little more severe hazards to titanium dioxide than other food chemicals. It can cause severe skin, severe eye irritation and potential eye damage. And there's recent speculation that it could be an also carcinogenic, which means it causes cancer because of the titanium dioxide building up over time. The body reacts to it and can cause cancer cells to form. So we talked about sodium benzoate, we talked about glycerol triacetate, and we talked about titanium dioxide. And we talked how, about how they were used in industry, consumer, and consumption purposes. So every time you want to reach for that soda or reach for that little pack of donuts covered in that white powdered sugar, stop and go, do I really want that de-icing product in my soda? Do I really want that paint in my donut? So before you eat it, are you reading what you're eating? Thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my uh, project for calculus-based physics um, with uh, Dr. Jin Ki Hyun. Um, my project consists of two parts, really. Um, first is to replicate an experiment conducted in the, uh, seventh, or the 18th century by Henry Cavendish, who was an English chemist um, and, and physicist. Uh, he's most known for his um, uh, discovery of hydrogen and his measurement of many of its properties. Uh, but this experiment has really profound um, implications for all of classical mechanics. The second part of the uh, project was to reformulate what Henry Cavendish had published in more math modern mathematical terms, uh, because what he had originally published was 
uh, a bit outdated uh, for one, and um, and when he set out to uh, when he conducted the experiment, he set out to measure something um, different than what the main than what it's actually known for. Uh, its major implications were, were implicit rather than explicit. Um, all right, but to understand the importance of the work, we have to go back over a century to the work of Isaac Newton, uh, who in the summer of 1687 uh, published his Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which laid the foundations for all of classical mechanics. Um, it's also where he introduced calculus for the very first time, inventing calculus-based physics, essentially. Now, in the Principia, um, and most relevant to this project, Newton published his Law of Universal Gravitation, uh, and that's the first ever mathematical formulation of a fundamental force of nature. Uh, it really um, solidified kind of physics for the very first time. Um, now, as some of you might know, the, uh, the law states that the force of gravity between two massive objects is proportional by some constant g uh, to the uh, product of the masses of the objects and indirectly proportional to their to the square of the distance between them. There was a problem though when when uh, Newton first did this because uh, he had no idea what g was um, because it was derived indirectly rather than directly. So he had to use approximations uh, based on uh, approximations of the density of the Earth, but his calculations never worked out very well. Um, this was resolved by Henry Cavendish in 1798, um, who successfully conducted an experiment which he, uh, which he described as designed to weigh the world, and by that he meant that he was setting out to determine the density of Earth, which is related to G, and that's the most important part of this experiment. Uh, you can get, if you know the radius of Earth, and, and if you know the, the density of Earth, then you can calculate G. And as, uh, you know, Ted Strike can tell you how important this formula is in, in uh, modern science, in space travel, and, and everything else. You have to be able to uh, calculate uh, trajectories, and uh, if you want your space probe to actually land on, on uh, what it's supposed to, and not veer off into the sun, or whatever it may be. Uh, so, the apparatus, um, which I made a small replica of, uh, consists of a large wooden frame, uh, as you can see here, and um, a long, and in the center, a long wooden bar on which, a balance bar on which, the, on the ends of which, say, um, are two equally, si or equally sized small weights. Um, and this balance bar is suspended uh, from the top of the frame by a rigid wire. He used um, a quartz fiber, and I used a, a copper wire because it's a lot cheaper. And uh, here's a top-down view, and it's a lot easier to explain this way. So the two, and then there, see the balance bar in the middle, and the, the two uh, weights on the ends there. Now on opposite sides, you have a much larger, arbitrarily large, but they have to be larger if you want this experiment to, you know, not take ages. So, um, once, this is a, is a, uh, once this is suspended, uh, you have to put a, a mirror on the wire and shine a light on it, and that, that is reflected onto a screen that you have. And once you, you set this up, and you have to make sure that all the weights are, are you know, uh, grounded because the electromagnetic force is a lot stronger than the, the gravity for the gravitational force so uh, it can interfere but you have to make sure that it's all taken care of you have to, and it's best if you can if you can put this kind of system in a in a vacuum um, the best that I could do was to you know lock it in a closet within you know without any air currents um, but once this happens eventually slowly the balance bar will start to turn and it'll begin to oscillate between, but to go back and forth, uh, between the two, um, uh, the two larger weights. Uh, then you can, tell, uh, you can tell the angle at which it's contorting uh, because of the, the light reflected on the screen. He had to use a, a candle and a 
a light box and I used a, a laser, so I cheated. But um, uh, it makes it easier, you know, and uh, once you have that, you can determine, uh, once you have the period of the oscillation, then you can determine it's uh, the uh, constant of, of um, uh, torsional, uh, torsion, and then you can determine the moment of force on the wire, and this is all technical jargon and blah, blah, blah. Eventually, however, once you have all that information, you can derive, uh, in some long mathematical formulae uh, here, you can derive G from it all. And that can, you know, help you um, pilot your spaceship or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, now, uh, my results uh, weren't quite as good as Cavendish's because, you know, Cavendish had months and, you know, millions of pounds to work with and uh, I had a student's budget and uh, a few weeks. But um, uh, he can, he, when he conducted his experiment, uh, he found values that were within 1% of the currently accepted values. Uh, mine were within 7%, so not, not too bad. Um, pretty good for a little, little replica. But, uh, yeah. And with that, I thank you for your time and your attention, and good night. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eileen Gallo Treadway. I'm a child care specialist for 15 years and I decided to go back in 2013 and I'm very thankful to the Rome State Community College for giving me an opportunity to go back and um, have a degree in the early childhood field. Um, this uh, project, honors project, is very special to me because when I started um, coming here in the United States uh, I don't even know ab anything about children and this is my first job as a child care specialist because when I move here, um, I have to take care of my step stepchildren and I don't even have any clue how, to, how you know, things about children because I never had a children. So I decided to work at the Henry Center. Everybody knows the Henry Center because they have been there for more than 20 years. And uh, I worked there for seven years and um, they are dealing with uh, children with special needs and also preschool and I grow so much on that field and I was able to apply it with my children. And um, I decided to do the PowerPoints uh, through the mentorship of Ms. Uh, Professor Nicole White and uh, because um, I take the computer applications and I decided to incorporate the preschool and the child development learning on this project. A lot of times, a lot of people will be thinking like, back in the days, childcare is just about babysitting. And, but nowadays, through a lot of curriculum, they already, there's already a lot of things changed, and they are already started doing the different uh, curriculum that had uh, long-term benefits for early childhood education to children. What is preschool? Uh, preschool is an educational program environment which is targeting young children uh, they were like before they go to the kindergarten which is very very important because when the baby is born and they were little they already like uh, their synopsis of learning is very important because when they started learning through the age of six weeks until the age of three that is the fast phase that their synopsis is really working and then when they turn four and five they are started slowing them so that uh, they're always saying that it's always very important to teach and have a good, good young education for children when they were little there are different types of preschool as you can see on the picture there is um, 
the center base, which is the state pre K. They also are doing uh, like the Henry Center and the Head Start. They are those uh, government fund. And they also ha have some uh, in-home in based daycare. Those are the daycares that um, there's uh, somebody that taking care or keeping some children, but they also have some curriculum going on because it's already a state regulation that when you are uh, getting a state license for children, you have to get a good curriculum that will be targeting different domains of their development. They also have what you call half day preschool program and some charge based preschool. As I talked a while ago about the different domains of development or areas of learning, children, part of the curriculum on the state regulation, they have cognitive development where they are, this is the intellectual part where they're gonna be learning a lot of um, reasoning, intellectual, and also language development. You know, when the baby were still little, you put them in the childcare facility, uh, you read them books, uh, you teach them, you sing songs to them, nursery songs, that is a good foundation for their oral language development. And as they're growing, they started to learn how to make um, little language and then it will be expanding that they will be able to learn how to make sentences. Physical development, which is the fine and motor and gross motor skills. Fine motor skills is when you teach the children how to color, crayons, how to paint, using little, uh, their little motor skills. And the gross motor skills is like when uh, part of the curriculum too, when uh, getting the state regulation, they need to, uh, to be able to go outside and play. That's why most of the uh, child care and most of them, they need to have like some big infrastructure outside that they can able to play, like swing, they can able to go up and down with the slides because that is where the gross motor skills or you can see them that they were pushing some, uh, some big cars in the playground. So that is where the physical development is. Reading and, and writing readiness, which you, when you read to them, they started um, learning things about the world around them and also the good foundation of their oral development and writing. At first, they, as they were babies, they really started, you know, scribbling and even though they were like just scribbling, that is already a good foundation for them. Later on in their life, they will be able to learn how to have control of their hand, how to write and trace, and then later on, they're going to be able to learn how to, to write letters and then the good foundation for them to write their names. Mathematics readiness, which is so good because as young children, they will be able to learn like um, sorting objects like um, the triangle or the circle. They can able to know how to sort them out and they will be able to learn the color recognition, the number recognition, so and also like counting skills. So that those are good foundation. Social and emotional development. When the um, in the childcare, they usually enroll, uh, they're accepting babies from six weeks. Most of the time, the parents, you know, it's very hard for them, especially when it is their first child and they said they feel guilty or, you know, they, you know, it's very hard for them because of the attachment, but I always telling my parents, that is the best decision you ever made because in the long run, you will be able to find out that as these children is being exposed to the environment and along with their friends, their social and emotional development is being developed. So when they go to kindergarten, they know how to be around with the other kids. They, they're, not going, they're not going to have so much stranger danger. And so I told, and that is so good too for the parents because the kids will be able to learn a lot of things that, that the parents cannot provide at home. There's 
a lot of benefits of preschool. And one of them are the preschool environment is structured. Of course, um, we follow the state regulation and this is a very good setting for the kids. They will be able to make friends. They will be able to learn through their friends and they will be able to experience things that they never experience at home. <coughs> Preschool promotes social and emotional development. They will be able to learn how to share. They will be able to learn how to uh, have self-soothing with, with themselves because, you know, uh, of course, at home, most of the time, uh, especially when they are just the only child. And then, of course, at home, there's no competition. You take them to the childcare facility, they will be able to learn how to share with friends. They will be able to learn that if it is not their turns, they will be able to wait for their turns. Children learn to take care of themselves and others. They started having their development of caring and nurturing their friends, especially like for example, most of the children, they are very, very sweet. It's like very natural. And when they saw their friends are sad, they get sad too. And when they will ask me, Miss Eileen, my friend is sad. I don't know what's wrong with her. I said, do you think you need to talk with your friends or you need to, you, they need somebody to talk to? And so that is one of the things that, that, that develop with themselves because they learn how to care for each other. And even on the pets, you know, things that they grow naturally on them and they will be able to develop it. Even the care for the pets when they, when they went home, they will be able to learn how to share and they will be able to, to talk about you know, things that they learn from school and then when they go home, they apply it at home and then when they are around with other people, they have to learn things that they learn from the childcare facility. Children get to make choices, which is good because a lot of times uh, when they were at home, everything is like if they have toys everything is in there for them but when they go to the child care facility there's all kinds of uh, choices in there because there's different areas of learning they have um, cognitive development learning they have music center they, they have um, art center and they will be able to uh, to decide for themselves which one I want to do they can they can make choices that they think that will be best for them and if ever they need the help of their teacher they can able to guide them like for example on this picture they learn how to make like on their eating they can make choices which is the healthy food which you know most of the children of course they will be they will be more on like brownies or chocolates things like that but you know they they will still able to learn things which is good for them preschool promotes language and cognitive skills writing they will be able as uh, as young as they are they are already started learning how to trace their name they already know which is a good pattern for them what, how to write their name so when they start their kindergarten they already know how to because most of, most of the days now when I do my practicum in the Bowers Elementary they, they already writing their name they already uh, counting so things like that they, those are the most important things that the teachers are teaching with them that way when they go to the, to the kindergarten they are very much ready they learn how to read books sometimes children will come to me miss eileen can i read to you and it's so funny because sometimes you will read to them and then later on you will see us uh, some group of kids they will be there on the reading center and they were reading to their friends so that is very good um very good thing for them to to learn preschool teachers nurture a child's curiosity 
this is a thing that we are part also of the uh, preschool curriculum. We're teaching them science. We're teaching them sensory exploration. Like a paint, you will be, you know, sometimes we will be, um, some parents is like, you know, they, they will be playing with the paint and of course, so it's like, don't make a mess, but that is really good for them because that is where they learn how to explore and with like you can incorporate them with different aspects like asking them open-ended questions and then that's how they gonna learn why the leaves is green where the leaves came from you know things like that so that is where the teachers are nurturing a child's curiosity you educate them you teach them and they will able to learn things Preschool activities boost pre-math and literacy skills. They learn how to read and they learn how to count sorting objects and they will be able to learn letter recognition, number recognition. And those things are things that they can apply. Like for example, five, you, you gave them five objects and they have to match it with the number five or the number four so they will be able to have a recognition about the numbers and that is very good thing that uh, thinks that one of the requirements that they can learn before they go to the kindergarten preschool helps develop motor skills cutting papers that is good for their fine motor skills they learn how to have control with their hand when they started cutting things and building blocks which is so good for them because they will be able like some some kids they will be on the black center they will they will be building like a tunnel of the train or you know some blocks that they will be able to play little cars so that is good for their motor skills preschool is an opportunity for growth they learn things around them, plants, they can able to experiment, they can able to see how, like for example, on the experiment, a little seeds, and you know how you teach them how to grow a little seeds and they, it will turn into a plant and again answering open-ended questions to them so they will learn things around them. And also uh, painting, pre-style painting, like, I, like what I always tell my kids, there is no right or wrong, especially on the pre-style painting, because that is their self-exploration. They can able to, ex, uh, to explore and they can able to express themselves. And most of all, preschool prepares children for kindergarten. So when they go to kindergarten, they're very much ready. I can see a lot of kids that is very very successful on kindergarten because I remember when I used to teach um, Henry Center it's very precious that most of the children in there that I I taught when I do my practicum last year in the Bowers Elementary they were in there and the uh, teachers even told me like they were thriving so you can really pretty much see what is the difference of the kids that have been to pre-k and the kids that are not been on the pre-k and for conclusion kindergarten preschool education programs produce long-term improvements in school success including higher achievement test scores lower rates of grade repetition and special education and higher educational attainment. That's all and have a great night. So yeah, my name is Riza Wolf and um, I wanted to do something for psychology which is my passion. Now uh, my sponsor is Don Wyndham and um, this took me two semesters to complete. Um, so let's just, let's just go with it. Um, my first semester, I wanted to see what made um, clicks happen, especially in females, because we all have been there. Um, girls can be very mean, and uh, clicks are easily formed. So I wanted to see when clicks are formed, and I noticed that in kindergarten, 
um, this is usually the age where kids are mostly egotistical and very, it's all about me. Um, so my hypothesis was that females that showed more popularity would be more intelligent. So the more a kid would raise their hand, the more popular they would be in the class. Um, so I simply took two months to watch a group of kindergarten, kindergartners in their class and I would write down every single time they would raise their hand or basically every single time they would do something. I mostly focused on females for my hypothesis, of course, and it took me 16 vi visits. So four classroom visits, four um, recess visits, and four lunch visits. Um, so in conclusion, even though the classroom setting was not the best, so um, most of the activities were in groups, and there wasn't a lot of opportunity for the kids to be raising their hands, I did notice that there are two different types of popularity within the females. So for privacy matters, I did change their names, um, so Tara and Maddie. So the popularity didn't really come from them being intelligent or raising their hand more often. It simply came from the other students wanting to be like them. So my second semester, I wanted to see their self-concepts. I wanted to see why they did what they did. Um, and kind of, I wanted to understand them, especially if they were kindergarten, kindergartners, they were very complex. Uh, so a self-concept uh, is your stable understanding of oneself and one's adequacy. So your self-value really depends on this. So your self-concepts will become often distorted if your self-concept is challenged. Um, usually if I believe I'm a cool person and someone says that I'm not, I'm going to have a very high anxiety level and I will try to ignore their own feelings. I will deny their feelings and I'll deny them even as a, as a person. That um, will cause my self-concept to become very distorted. So Tara, even though she was in kindergarten, her self-concept was pretty distorted. Um, so she believed that she was a teacher's favorite. Um, she believed that if she controlled her other classmates, she would get her desired results. So I used three factors to um, address her self-concept, to see her way of thinking. So number one, her own observations. She believed that she was the teacher's favorite and she was the only favorite. Her verbal and direct, she was very verbal and direct with this self-concept. She would often tell me and other students that she was the favorite. However, her feedback from others, she needed to be able to control others for her desired results. She needed to keep that anxiety down, no matter what it cost her. So she would cop copy the other classmates' work and pull it off as her own. She would seek approval from me, but however, I'm the neutral person. I'm the simple observer. I couldn't give her what she wanted, so she moved on. She continued to play the headache game with the other girls. This required her to slap the other females' heads repeatedly until they got a headache. Ultimately, she won because no one else was slapping her. She would also make other classmates scream and cry. Mind you, these are kindergartners. I was very surprised. Um, she would make them scream and cry. Therefore, she would get the attention of the teacher. She would then turn around and start comforting her classmate, then getting her that required result. She wanted that praise. Her individualism. Now, in order to be you know, very individual, you need to have your own desire, your own goal. Usually, that means my desire, my own goal, overstepped other people's. So her desire to be the teacher's favorite gave her the right and the control to, you know, beat up on everyone. Her happiness of the other students did not limit her for her processes. Maddie, the other popular girl, she has two, one being a good friend and one being smart. Her own, her own observations, Maddie believed that she was a good friend and a good classmate. However, she was not very vocal about this she just seemed to be good. So the feedback from others, even though she, again, did not address me personally, um, her other classmates would always go to her. You can obviously see that she was more popular because she was more nicer. Furthermore, Maddie did go invest investigate or protect her other, other classmates without being directly asked. So her individualism, her desire to be a good friend did outweigh the desire of her classmates, but that could be questionable. Um, mostly because her classmates already knew that she would be readily available whenever they needed her. She would understand her value. She would often threaten her other classmates, like, I'm not going to be your friend anymore if you don't do this for me. Therefore, she would do what, they, what she asked. Maddie did not 
push her limits because she understood her need in the class. So her second self-concept, she was intelligent. She believed she was a smart student. She relied on the teacher's praise, however, to understand where she stood in the class. So the feedback from others, she constantly raised her hand. She would listen to the teacher and she would control her other classmates, you know, therefore trying to help the teacher out or wanting to be the one who raised her hand most often. Her actions were not really noticed by, uh, to the teacher. She was more noticed by the classmates. Classmates knew she was really smart. So her individualism, her desire to be smart, was her own goal. It wasn't really a big major goal for everyone else. However, her other classmates knew that she was always readily available to her. So the difference is, Tara believed that controlling others equaled the praise from the teacher. She believed more power equals more control. Um, so this resulted in the misplaced praise from the teacher. She would act out in order to maintain her self-concept because it was constantly being challenged. She had to keep that anxiety low. Maddie, on the other hand, acted out in order to achieve good. She received the voluntary power from her classmates, not out of fear. She received trust instead of praise from the teacher, um, and she was the good student stereotype. Both, however, were seeking that approval and that praise from the teacher or higher peers. Both believed that maintaining, or the way they were maintaining their self-concepts was ultimately good. And even though they maintained those self-concepts differently, they did believe in the same thing. They solely looked out for themselves. However, ultimately, both students were able to understand any pain they would inflict on others and the amount of control they would gain. So thank you guys for listening. Hi, my name is Christine Ong. And today, as, as, um, as Mr. Dan Heider said, I'm going to be talking about uh, Moby Dick. I actually planned on putting up this up and asking you what book I was going to read, but what, what, what book I was going to be talking about. But that's okay. So um, let me move on to my next um, slide. So Moby Dick can be easy, is one of the few books that can be easily identified by three primary words that really summarize it, the white whale. I'm going to be talking about how it remains a relevant literary work today and how Melville's life also really influenced how he wrote this book. Because Herman Melville, as you all know, is the author of Moby Dick. But before I do that, I want to state my personal interest in Moby Dick. Um, so I actually read Moby Dick for my eighth grade class. I was actually in, disinterested in the novel because pretty much the teacher bullied and dared me into reading it. Terrible teacher, but that's beside the point. <laughs> a lot of the themes in the history of Moby Dick really interested me. Actually, when Moby Dick first came out, um, let me skip to a slide. There we go. It was actually so unpopular that its price was really low. Here's a cane mutiny. Was it? I don't, I've never heard of it before, have you? But apparently, it was a very huge pit in, in 1851. It cost 3.95 or 34.37 in today's American currency. Whereas Moby Dick, which is really popular these days, and it, it was it, it, pe critics pretty, pretty much thought it was terrible, so they sold it for like about 9.46 in today's American currency. It received a lot of criticism. Some was good. Some was bad. Um, some people said, Moby Dick has left no mark on literature, messy, uneven, awful. However, others also said it was okay-ish, you know, not that good, but okay. Romantic, fanciful, literal, literal, pretty interesting. Here, there was actually a real-life inspiration for Moby Dick. Um, he, he, this is called a sperm whale, and, 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 and people speculate that that's what Herman Melville based Moby Dick on, this little sperm whale. Or big sperm whale. <laughs> Some of the main themes in Moby Dick were the themes of revenge, friendship, and unpredictability. As you all know, Captain Ahab in Moby Dick, the, the plot pretty, pretty much revolves around this captain. A whale bit off his leg, he's out to kill the whale. So um, that's very, he's very vengeful. There's, there's also a friendship, uh, um, the quality of friendship, however, throughout this book, because a lot of the people there were pretty much friends, because you have to understand, they want sperm whale hunting so they could get the sperm whale oil to, to light up their gas lamps in 1851. It's a very dangerous job, you know, if, if, if you fall off a ship, if you get eaten by a whale, you know, you could die. So I guess, they, they, so I guess that's why they, they made such strong friendships. 
Because in many ways, they relied on each other to keep themselves alive. Finally, there's a sense of unpredictability. Let's see, Captain Ahab was unpredictable. The sea was unpredictable. The whale was unpredictable. It's a very unpredictable book, we would safe to say. Here's a picture of the author, Herman Melville. So let's talk about the man behind the novel. Melville was actually a sailor. Um, he pretty much, his family struggled with finances. So when he was a kid, he, his dad said, hey, you know, Melville, you go, you go out there, you, you become a sailor, you get us some money, okay? So, so he spent a lot of his life as a sailor. How, um, so, and he also actually wrote a few other um, sailing books, pretty much, books about boats and sailing. Um, however, though, he, he was pretty much just a so-so author, didn't really receive a lot of praise for his works during his lifetime. And actually, when he was older, he became very melancholy and almost a recluse, very reclusive almost. So there's actually a true story that Moby Dick was based off of. Um, in the novel, Moby Dick sinks a ship at the end of the book. In reality, there was actually a whaling ship called the Essex that was sunk, that was reportedly attacked and sunk by a sperm whale. Moby Dick is described as a horribly white sperm whale. In the picture I saw you, that is more of a grayish, but it doesn't really matter. The whale that sunk the ship was also a sperm whale similar to the one described in Melville's novel. In the novel, only one sailor survives after the ship has sunk. In reality, there are multiple survivors of the Essex. Unfortunately, um, they actually had to draw straws, like pretty much pick, who, pick and choose who was going to die. So the rest of the crew could feed on, feast on them and survive, just to survive. Awful, right? And unimaginable. There's actually a movie called The Heart of the Sea. Um, it, it was based off of Moby Dick, and the, uh, it was actually not, not so much about Moby Dick as about the Essex, the story behind Moby Dick. I felt like it was sort of dramatized, but overall it was actually pretty accurate. Dramatized? Yes. <laughs> so, I, so I want to talk, so my main point here is going to be about revenge as portrayed in Moby Dick. Is it really worth it? Worth it? So in conclusion, my conclusion is no, uh, unless, unless you're willing to ruin yourself, ruin the person you really want to get that revenge on, ruin your family even, because I mean, look at Ahab. He wanted revenge so bad, at, 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 he wanted to get his revenge on Moby Dick so bad, that in the end, Moby Dick sank his ship, all his crew died except for this poor, that one guy. Um, he died. Uh, you know, and then I would, I would almost say Moby Dick survived, Moby Dick won, so I mean like, is it really worth it? No, thank you. As I call your name, please come up to get your certificate and your pen. <clears throat> Rita Neal is not here tonight. Kaylin Pellucci. Hunter Bosnick. Olivia Cannon. Lacey Cantrell. <clears throat> Daniel Cherry. Emily Lena. <laughs> Stephanie Mullins. Zachary Strickland. Juan Zach, he's making his way up Aileen Treadway. Breeze Wolf. Victoria Bailey. Victoria here. Yep. Thank 
Kaylin Lawen. <coughs> Olivia Cannon. Lacey Cantrell. Haley Davis. Shelly Edwards. Haley Goldston. Jamie Hardle. Allison Henson. Savannah Hollers. Ariel McFadden, Christina Ong, I have your certificate. Thank you. Thank you. And let me get out my list here. I Got them four. These are students who earned at least. 12 hours of honors credits, and we'll be getting honors associate. I know a lot of them aren't here tonight, but if we call your name, we have a medallion for you. China Barnett is in the School of Tennessee Tech now. Heidi Davis, Rachel Furman, Allison Henson, Aaron Isham, Olivia Lehman, Amy McCready, Gabrielle Morgan, Kaylee Morgan, Lauren Sillinger, Janine Smith, Seth Stewart, Sarah Williamson, Theresa Woody. Honors Diploma, Olivia Beats, Taylor Bilal, Hunter Bosnick, Danielle Cherry, Treva Courier, Jessica Davis, Julius Krupp, Emily Lena, Holly McCollum, Mary Jo Nevers, Melissa Rogers, Aileen Treadway, and Amber Zimprich. Let's have a hand for everyone who presented tonight. <laughs> we saw a lot of good presentations tonight, and uh, it went a little bit longer than it normally does because we've never had this kind of participation before. I think we set a record for the number of uh, students who presented probably the number of students who did projects this year and the number of projects. So it's been a great year for honors. We hope you have a safe trip home. We hope you'll come back again next year when we do this again. So thank you very much.